In August of 1415, King Henry V of England set sail from Southampton at the head of a huge army with the intention of pressing the old English claim to the throne of France. After a lengthy siege at the port city of Harfleur, Henry moved with his army across country through northern France, probably heading for Calais, and he was also probably looking for a fight. And a fight is exactly what he got at Agincourt. The Battle of Agincourt is one of the most famous events in British history, but it's also one of the most misunderstood. History is not necessarily about what happened. It's often about what someone wants you to think happened, or it's about how we wish it had been. Over the last 600 years, the story of Agincourt has become intertwined with concepts of English identity and notions of Anglo-French rivalry. We imagine it as a battle solely between low-born English archers against a vastly superior number of aristocratic French knights. And that's an enormously appealing image because it's a, it's a model for class war. And right at the center of this idea is, of course, the image of the English longbow which is imagined to be some kind of super weapon. We tend to create stories that appeal to us, and then we have a habit of imposing those stories on the past. When Shakespeare wrote his famous play, Henry V, he did so at a time when English armies had again been fighting in France. And then during the Second World War, when Winston Churchill commissioned Laurence Olivier to make a film of Henry V, he did so again for the same reasons, to boost morale in advance of the Allied invasion of France. So now, when we look back towards the Agincourt period, we do so through layers of later myth and misconception. How then can we learn more about what actually happened? Of course, there are the written sources in libraries and archives, but beyond that, we can also look at objects. For example, weapons and armor that were really used at the time. Looking at objects brings us into a very immediate physical contact with the past. Central to the myth of Agincourt is the idea that armor is incredibly heavy. And that leads to strange, nonsensical ideas like the need for knights to be winched onto their horses with cranes. In reality, armored knights mounted their horses in the usual way, and they weren't nearly as encumbered by their armor as we tend to imagine. The fallacy of incredibly heavy armor has had a very powerful influence on traditional interpretations of the battle. We often take the apparent fact that the French wore quite a lot of heavy armor as evidence that they were somehow out of touch. When we start to look at real armor, we quickly realize that our story of this battle has to change. This is a fine male shirt dating from the late 14th or early 15th century. It's made up of thousands of interlocking iron links, each one of which has been carefully riveted closed, providing excellent protection against cuts from sharp bladed weapons, and it could even stop some thrusting and stabbing attacks. It was also incredibly flexible. It's a metal fabric which achieved a good balance of protection and mobility and protected areas of the body which the plates couldn't. So worn under plate armor at Agincourt, mail like this helped proof the French armor against the thousands of arrows loosed by the English. This is a very rare example of a type of closely fitted helmet called the bassinet. Thousands of helmets like this one were almost certainly worn at Agincourt. It gave good protection to the vulnerable area around the throat where mobility was really important. The pointed visor of this helmet was designed to deflect arrows and other weapons striking the wearer directly in the face. 
Another classic element in the myth of Agincourt has the English archers shooting high up into the air at long range so that they sort of drop the arrows down onto their enemies' heads from above. However, eyewitness accounts of the battle tell us that the English shooting was so thick that the French feared that the sights and the sides of their visors would be pierced, not the tops of their heads. This strongly built helmet was only vulnerable in those small areas, the sights or vision slots and breaths, the ventilation holes on the sides of the visor. A key part of the true reality of the battle, therefore, is found by interpreting the written accounts alongside the surviving objects. And those two things, in this case, looked at together, tell us that the archers, in fact, were shooting straight on at close range, and the French were getting hit straight in the face. Although armor surviving in museum collections has a lot to tell us, to build up a more complete picture of the armored warrior at the time of Agincourt, we have to look elsewhere, not in museums, but in churches. Medieval funerary effigies are an incredibly important source of evidence in the study of armor. The best examples were carved with fantastic skill and display a startling level of technical detail. This beautiful alabaster example belongs to Sir Edmund Thorpe, one of King Henry V's battle-hardened captains. Here we can see every rivet, every strap, every tiny detail cut with phenomenal skill into the alabaster. The armor was the man. So it was essential that on his effigy, all of the technical details should be right. The Battle of Agincourt is just one of an almost infinite number of examples of how we can become very confused and mixed up about what really happened in the past. And looking at objects is a powerful way of complementing the written sources. They give you a tangible, physical anchor for better informed interpretation. So that's why it's really important to look at things in museums like the Wallace Collection.